Take your Bibles together with me and turn to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6. I want to cover with you this morning verses 30 through 56, but I want to set the context for you to start with by beginning with verse 7. We, in Mark's gospel in chapter 6, we come to the point where Jesus is really at the high point of the popularity of his ministry. Um, the people in Galilee have, ha have seen numerous miracles, countless miracles that he's done. Uh, just to give you a taste of his popularity and the, the depth and breadth of his outreach and his uh, expansive reputation from the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry when he started doing uh, the work there in Galilee. We read in Mark chapter 4 and verse 23 that Jesus was going throughout all of Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every kind of disease and every kind of sickness among the people. And the news about him spread throughout all of Syria, and they brought to him all who were ill, those suffering with various diseases and pains, demoniacs, epileptics, paralytics, and he healed them. Large crowds followed him from Galilee, which is the northern part of the land of Israel, and the Decapolis, which is east of Israel, and Jerusalem and Judea, which is the southern part of Israel, and from beyond the Jordan, which is to the east of the land of Israel. So way up north, way down south, way to the east, all the way to the coast. Jesus' popularity is abundant, and he's doing numerous miracles. However, by the time you get to the second, the, near the, uh, to the end of the second year of Jesus' earthly ministry, he has begun to renounce the cities in which he has done the ma majority of his miracles, saying, if, I had done, if, if those kinds of miracles had been done in Sodom and Gomorrah, they'd still be around to this day because they would have repented. And your response to me is superficial, positive uh, responses. You're interested in what I'm doing. You're loving the benefit from what I'm doing. But the one thing that Jesus addresses the multitudes with most often is, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do what I say? We come uh, to the point where Jesus has now begun to teach in parables. Why? Because God never caters to unbelief. Having given an abundance of evidence through the miracles and the clear proclamation of the good news of the gospel of the kingdom to the people, particularly in Galilee, and them not having responded except for in a, in a superficially positive sense, with enthusiasm and excitement, but not submission to his lordship and to his authority, true recognition of his person, he begins not to make the message easier to understand, catering to their unbelief, but instead begins to teach in parables so that those who do believe, so that those who are his disciples, he can continue to instruct them about the kingdom. But for the multitudes, it becomes harder to understand. And at this point, Mark 6, verse 7, he summons the 12 together. And he began to send them out in pairs. So this is multiplying sixfold the proclamation of the gospel of the kingdom there in the land of Israel. He sends them out in pairs and he gives them authority to act on his behalf, not only to speak on his behalf, but to act on his behalf in doing miracles. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits and instructed them that they should take nothing for their journey except a mere staff, no bread, no bag, no money in their belt, uh, but uh, to wear sandals, don't put on two tunics, etc. And when you compare this with the uh, uh, parallel accounts, you can see that he says, basically, take what you have and depend upon God to provide for you as you go out and do ministry for him. Depend upon God and go out and act on my behalf do things like miracles and casting out demons and the authority that I'm bestowing upon you and preach the, the message of the kingdom. You come to Mark 6 and verse 30 in the beginning of the text that I want to look at uh, together with you. This morning, you see the apostles, after they had completed that mission, they gathered together with Jesus. So they come back now and they report to him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. 
because there were many people coming and going, and they did not even have time to eat. And so they went away in the boat to a secluded place by themselves. So Jesus, in this final year of his earthly ministry, is beginning to distance himself from the popularity and the rush of the crowds and focus his attention on training up the disciples for the ministry that is ahead for them. And he sends them out on their first, essentially, apostolic ministry, their apostolic uh, mission to go out and speak for him, act on his behalf, do miracles, come back, and they start telling him about how it went. And he says, you know what? There's so much hype and so much going on. Let's separate ourselves from the multitudes so that you can have a little downtime and I can continue to instruct you. Now, that's the historic context here. And Jesus is very clearly seeking to invest himself by teaching his disciples in preparation now for the ministry that is in store for them. He's focusing on training the 12 for their ministry, not just doing the ministry himself. He's already begun to distance himself to a degree from the multitudes. He is continually interacting with the religious leaders and their contention and opposition to him. He knows full well exactly where he's headed. He's headed to the cross. And so this is part of his preparation of the disciples for ministry. And what I want you to see as we walk through the text of Mark 6, verses 30 to 56 this morning, is I want you to see that Jesus is seeking to teach the disciples an essential lesson that's necessary for life in ministry. And that is... In the Lord's work, you need to learn to look up. You need to learn to look up. If you're looking for a title for this morning's message, I think that's as good as any. Learning to look up. What I want you to see is two miracles that Jesus does, and both of them are intended by way of object lessons to teach the disciples as he sends them out and prepares them for the future in being sent out. He, he is training them teaching them through objective lessons to learn to look up. When God gives you a command, when I give you a charge, when I give you instructions, when I give you a mission, and I tell you to do it, when you realize it is beyond your ability and your own strength and your own energy to be able to accomplish it, what should you do? Look up. Look to God and depend upon Him to provide you what you need to accomplish that task. Your ministry as an apostle, this message very clearly is for Peter and James and John and Andrew, Matthew and the rest. The lesson you need to learn, gentlemen, is I gave you the ability to do miracles, but it's really me working through you. I'm going to send you out into the world to speak for me and empower you to act on my behalf. But what you need to understand is that I'm going to assign you things that you cannot do in your own strength and you need to learn to depend upon me. There are two miracles that Jesus does in Mark 6, verses 30 to 56, which have their prim primary uh, point in teaching the disciples to depend upon Christ in life and ministry and to learn to look up. If you're looking for an outline, as we take a look at these two miracles, you can simply use the, the content uh, as your identifiers, the feeding of the multitudes in verses 30 to 44, and the walking on the water in verses 45 to 56. Or if you want something that Austin will give you more marks for on your paper, you can say the teaching lesson and the testing lesson. Uh, the, to the teaching of the lesson and the testing of his students, sorry. I, I, I prefer the simpler things that are content-oriented, so I'm going to focus on the feeding of the multitudes and the walking on the water. And these are the two miracles that Jesus does that are both intended to teach his disciples a very practical lesson about life and ministry. And that is when God calls you to do something that you don't have the strength, the ability to do in your own, on your own, you need to learn to look up as one of his people and ask him to empower you, and then in faith and obedience, do what he's told you to do. And it's that simple. 
Now, as I mentioned in verse 30, we have the apostles gathering together with Jesus. They report to him all that they had done and taught. And you got to imagine how excited they must have been to come back and say, hey, I cast out a demon. And, and can you imagine that the, a little bit of the competitive rivalry, just as if it was TMS students that had been sent out like this? Can you imagine uh, Daniel bragging about, oh, hey, listen, I had this lady and this was a situation and I cast them out. And Travis is going, well, that's nothing. I, that we, I had this situation, right? And, and they're talking about that. They're excited to have been used by God. They're excited to have preached on, on Christ's behalf. They're excited to share the reaction of people, etc. They all get together and they're really excited to tell Jesus all about it and to share it with each other. And he says, you know what? Jesus says, we need to get away and I need to spend some time with you. Come away by yourselves to a secluded place and rest for a while. And the reason he says this is because there are so many people coming and going. They didn't even have time to eat. They were so busy and so many people were asking for miracles and asking for time from that. Now, not just from Jesus, no doubt, but also probably from some of the, the apostles who have now done miracles as well. And so they get in a boat and they go away to a secluded place by themselves. According to Matthew 14 and verse 13 in the parallel text, it tells us that Jesus had also just heard about John the Baptist being executed. So Jesus is purposely withdrawing uh, from uh, the, the, the play, uh, fr uh, withdrawing from the threat of Herod. And so the people saw them going. And many recognized them and ran there together on foot from all the cities and got there ahead of them. And so this is in the Sea of Galilee. This is Capernaum, and he's leaving and heading off into uh, the place in the northeastern area of the Sea of Galilee where it's more deserted. It's, a, it's away from the towns. It's away from the villages. It's away from the people. But if you've ever been to Israel, which I highly recommend, if you've ever been to Israel, you know that pretty much from the, from the shore of the Sea of Galilee, you can pretty much see the whole sea, and you can see from one side of the Sea of Galilee to the other. And so when the people on the shore see them getting into what was probably Peter's boat that they probably normally used or always used, they get into the boat and they start across the sea. And they're not going to get too far offshore where you can't see them and you see where they're going. And, and this is Jesus, the miracle worker. This is Jesus, the popular, and all of his disciples are there. So they're all going to run it down and chase him down. And they travel along on foot along the shore. Many of them even get there before he does. And so by the time... They get to shore, verse 34, when Jesus went ashore, he saw a large crowd. He's trying to get away from the crowd. By the time he gets there, there's already a large crowd. And he goes, oh, nuts, let's go back to the other side and see how long it takes for these people to just give up. He gets off and rebukes them and says, all of you guys, this is time for us for having a private session. Go away. Is that what the text says? No. This is, the, this is the character of, and nature. This is a footnote, by the way, so this doesn't count against my time. But notice he felt compassion for them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. You know, in, in pastoral ministry, and many of you have probably already begun to experience this. There's a lot of people that, that because you're a pastor, they want your time. Because you're a pastor, they expect your time. And it would be very easy it, it can be very easy to become a little bit frustrated, a little bit weary of it. Uh, do you really need me to answer the same question for you yet again? And yet you'll notice that Jesus' response is always the same. The only people he gets agitated with are, are those who are hard-hearted and stiff-necked. The people that are lost. The people that are poor and sick and downtrodden, he is always characterized by compassion toward them. And so here he sees the multitudes and he feels compassion for them. Why? Because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And so he begins to teach them many things. Matthew adds in the parallel that he healed their sick. So he started doing miracles and he started teaching them and he just started giving himself away like he always does. He just started giving himself away just started ministering to them. And you'll notice in verse 35, we are told that when it was already quite late, his disciples came to him and said, this place is desolate. We're, we're in the middle of nowhere, which technically, by the way, uh, I've been there. 
It's not exactly the middle of nowhere. Roosevelt Community Church is in the middle of nowhere. Okay, but this is close to the middle of nowhere. He said, this place, they, they said to him, the disciples come to him when it's quite late, means that the sun is setting. It's, it's very late in the day. They've been there all day ministering. And his disciples come to him and they say, this place is desolate. It's already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. Now, keep your finger here and turn with me to John 6. I want you to look at a parallel account here. John chapter 6. I think this really helps to flesh out what's going on here. John 6. Well, we'll just quickly start in verse 1. After these things, Jesus went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. Again, separating himself from the crowds. A large crowd followed him because they saw the signs which he was performing on those who were sick. And Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. The Passover, the feast of the Jews, was near. Therefore, Jesus, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming to him, said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Notice Jesus starts the day before he really begins pouring himself into the people. He starts the day by asking Philip, where are we to buy bread so that all these people can eat? And the text is going to tell us by the end that there are 5,000 men, and Matthew tells us, plus women and children. So conservative estimate, 10,000 people. More realistic estimate, 20 or 30,000 people. Uh, ever been to a, a, ever been to a, a ball game? Uh, for years, my son and I went to Oracle Arena to watch the Warriors once every year, uh, and uh, it was a my son just loved the Warriors, and so I know it's not a real sport, basketball, but uh, because of my son, we went, and and it turned out that it, that it was the Steph Curry years, and so it was pretty cool to be in a building. But if you've ever been in an arena like that. And especially in Oracle Arena, it was so loud. You see the press of all the people, always sold out. And you're talking about 20,000 plus people all crammed into that small area. Okay, that's roughly the number of people we're talking about that have followed Jesus out into no place to listen to him teach and to be blessed by him as he's doing miracles and healings. Okay? They, they followed him into the wilderness, 20, 30,000 people to listen to him teach and to watch him do miracles or benefit from his miracles. And when Jesus sees all of these people coming, he says to his disciples at the beginning of the day, where, and he says specifically to Philip, where are we to buy bread so that these may eat? Notice in verse 6, it says, This he was saying, that is, Jesus was saying, to test him. Because he himself, Jesus personally, already knew what he was intending to do. Jesus knew what he was going to do at the end of the day. This was not, this is not like, okay, if you guys can't fix it, then I guess I'll have to do it again. All right, Jesus knew from the beginning of the day what he was going to do. Why does he ask Philip? To test him. If, If he's not going to be able to spend the day teaching lessons and spending time with them if he's going to have to spend the day teaching the multitudes and being available to do miracles with them all day I'm going to have to teach my disciples an object lesson so he says to Philip how are we going to uh, provide where are we going to buy bread so that all these people can eat when we get to the end of the day Verse 7, Philip answered and said, 200 denarii worth of bread is not sufficient for them for everyone to receive even a little. Now, you stop right there and we go back to Mark. Think about this. You got the beginning of the day. Jesus pulls Philip aside and says, where are we going to buy bread to feed all these people? Because there's a lot of them. What do you think Philip is spending the whole day trying to figure out when he says 200 denarii, 200 days pay is not enough to to buy bread so that all these people can even have a little bit? That's what proves to you that we're talking way more than 5,000 people. We're talking 10,000 minimum, probably 20, 30,000 people. 200 days pay is not enough for everybody to get a small amount, much less uh, for everybody to be satisfied. What are we going to do? All day long, Philip is thinking about this. 
All day long, Philip is wondering about this. What do some of you guys do when you're not 100% sure what I said when we went through the details of Greek or Hebrew grammar? And you're going, oh, no, the the exam's coming up. What am I going to do? And so you start asking each other, right? Now, what are the disciples? What do you think the disciples did? They start asking each other, right? How are we going to solve this? How are we going to solve this? Why, by the way, do you think he said 200 denarii isn't enough to buy every food for everybody? Probably because that's the total amount of money that they had in their possession. Remember that Judas is the keeper of the money bag. So if we spend every, every denarius that we have in our possession, everybody isn't going to get something. That, that, that doesn't solve the problem. Now we go to Mark and we look that and see in verse 35, it's already quite late. And now his disciples come to him and they say to him, this place is desolate and it's already quite late. Send them away so that they may go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. What have they just concluded? Well, we can't solve the problem. But Jesus, verse 37, answered them and said, you give them something to eat. (laughs) Notice the direct command. You meet this need. And again, if you look in John 6, he's been telling them to figure this out all day long, right? You come to the end of the day, the best they can come up with is, we can't can't do it. He says, you give them something to eat. And and they said to him, shall we we go spend 200 denarii on bread and give them something? Should one of us run into town and spend all that we have and bring it back and distribute it so that we can at least try to meet the need? Is that what you're asking us to do? Because those are all the resources that we have. He said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and look. And as John points out, it's Andrew that found one little guy that his mom packed him a lunch. And as a cool little guy, he's willing to share it. So they have five uh, loaves and two fish. And remember that a loaf is just that small, flat loaf, right? Five little, uh, like, pita pockets and two small fish. 20,000 people plus. Uh, That's what we got. Practically nothing, but just a tiny little bit. He He commanded them all to sit down by groups on the green grass. And they sat down in groups of hundreds and fifties. And they took the five loaves and the two fish. Excuse me, he took the five loaves and the two fish. Looking up toward heaven, he blessed the food, broke the loaves, and kept giving them to the disciples to set before them. And he divided up the two fish among them as uh, all. And what was the end result? The first few people in line got a little bit, and everybody else went without. No, they all ate and were satisfied. You know, that Greek word behind the word satisfied there literally is a word that when used in reference to like livestock, horses and cattle and such, it means to be all foddered up. To eat to where you're full and you don't want any more. This is Thanksgiving when you when you pass on the pumpkin pie, which is really foolish because if you were smart like me, you would eat the pumpkin pie first and then not have room for peas. In any case, all foddered up is the idea here of being satisfied. They ate and were full and didn't want any more. And notice, they picked up 12 full baskets of the broken pieces and also of the fish. 12 full baskets of leftovers. Now, let me ask you a question. Why do you think there were 12 baskets of leftovers? Well, Jesus was tired, and so when he did the mental arithmetic as to how big of a miracle he needed to do, he just said, well, I'm just going to go a little bit big, and oh well. You think that's it? Why do you think there were 12, exactly 12 baskets left over? How many disciples were there? 12. One basket that provides for each disciple for tomorrow. One basket that provides of leftovers. By the way, why were only broken pieces picked up and not loaves? Because Jesus broke the loaves. 
So they went, he went, in fact, the, uh, the parallel tells us that Jesus instructed the disciples to go and gather up the broken pieces. And when they got done gathering up the broken pieces, lo and behold, each disciple has a full basket to provide for him and his needs for tomorrow. When God provides for you to do his work that he's told you to do, he will provide everything you need and in abundance. I read a number of commentators that get into a discussion, well, what about Jesus? Like his needs weren't provided for from tomorrow. It must have been that he was expecting the disciples to be willing to share with him tomorrow. All right. You know something? Jesus did the miracle to provide not for himself for tomorrow. He doesn't need to learn this lesson. This is a lesson that he's teaching to whom? To the 12 apostles. And each one of them has a reminder with them as they get ready to get into the boat and head across the sea uh, over the night that God has provided. Jesus told them from the beginning of the day, how are we going to solve this problem? And the best answer they can come up with is all of the resources we have won't provide for it. Do you want us to go ahead and spend it anyways? And so then he says, well, what do you have? He prays, multiplies the loaves, and there are leftovers, enough leftovers for each one of them to have an object lesson reminder that God will provide you what you need to do when he tells you to do something you can't do in your own strength. There it is. That's the lesson that Jesus is teaching the 12 right here as an object lesson. There were, verse 44, 5,000 men who ate the loaves. And again, if you look at Matthew 14 and verse 21 in a parallel, it says, not including women and children, which will push the number at least to 10,000, if not more like 20 or 30. So there's your first object lesson. Now, we get into the second object lesson, the walking on the water. This is where Jesus is going to put those same students to the test that he's just taught them a lesson. This is like a Thursday Greek quiz, isn't it? I taught the lesson on Tuesday, quiz you on Thursday to see if you actually paid attention. Verse 45, immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side to Bethsaida, while he himself was sending away or dismissing the crowd. And after bidding them farewell, he left for the mountain to pray. So that same mountain that, that he was sitting on as the rest of the multitudes were showing up, where he was at the beginning of the day sitting there with his disciples, getting ready to teach and do ministry all day when he challenged Philip, well, how, are we gonna, how, how can we buy bread for all of these guys? Okay, He goes up to that same place, away from the multitudes, sends his disciples into the boat, and sends them across the Sea of Galilee, now going... Uh, so they went from Capernaum over to the top northeast area into the wilderness area there. Now he sends them across down to the southwest, across the Sea of Galilee, over to where Bethsaida is. Now you can get into a big discussion about where specifically, etc. But I think for the sake of, of this morning, let's just keep it to this. It's across the Sea of Galilee. Roughly, round numbers, we're talking at most probably about seven miles uh, to go to the other side. Maybe more like five. Uh, depending on where Beth said it is. So let's just, for, for the sake of argument, say it's about five miles across. So he bids the crowd farewell. He sent, first sends the disciples across the sea on their own and says that he'll catch up with them. Okay? He, he dismisses the crowd. He goes up and he begins to pray. When it's evening, the boat was in the middle of the sea and he was alone on the land. Seeing them straining at the oars, for the wind was against them at about the fourth watch. Uh, so this is somewhere between 3 and 6 a.m. So if you want to do the math, let's, let's just say it was about 9 o'clock after the miracle had happened, after everybody ate, after Jesus is now dismissing them. He puts them in a boat and sends them across. You're looking at five, maybe seven miles journey across the Sea of Galilee. He goes up onto the mountain and prays. It's about 3 a.m. If you, if you estimate on the short side, they've spent six hours and made their way about three, three miles across the sea. That's a long night, wouldn't you agree? Full day of ministry, 
and he sent them across the sea on their own without him and said, here's where I want you to go. They're in the middle of the sea. He's alone on the land. And he sees them straining at the oars. Why? Because the wind was against them. And it's about the fourth watch of the night. It's about 3 a.m. And keep in mind, at least four of these guys are full-time professional fishermen that have been making their living for years on this very sea. They know how to sail. They know uh, about managing the wind. They know how to put their backs into the oars. They know what the situation is. And Jesus has told them to go across the Sea of Galilee. And they have been at it all night as professionals, and they made it about halfway across. They're in the middle of the sea, and they can't do it on their own. Sound familiar? Sound like a similar set of circumstances? Jesus has given them an instruction, and as they are trying to do it in their own strength and their own energy, and they are able to discern full well, they cannot do it on their own. What do they do? They just continue to put their back into it. They just continue to labor. You've got to appreciate their steadfastness, their, their faithfulness, their love for Christ, and their commitment to do what he said. At the same time, you've got to marvel at how daft they are, or maybe we should all just look in the mirror and realize we're every bit as daft. Seeing them straining at the oars, really working at it. Because the wind was against them at about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. He's just walking across the water. Why? Because he's God. So he's going to walk across the water. And here's the part that just, I love this part. It just amazes me. This is, this is my Jesus. My Lord, my Savior, my God. He intended to pass by them. I, 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 that just, I, I love that. Some people have asked, uh, and I won't even get to the, the various uh, different suggestions. Some have suggested Jesus was thoughtless, that he was heartless, that he was indifferent to his disciples, or that he was showing off. Oh, look, I can walk on water and you guys can't even row against the sea. Really? That's your takeaway? You, you want to know why he was going to pass him by? Think about it. What did he just teach them the previous evening? When I give you something to do and you cannot do it in your own strength, what are you supposed to do? Look up and ask God for help. And so when you couldn't solve the feeding pr uh, problem that I gave you all day to work on, what did I do for you? I looked up and asked for help. I separated myself from you or you from me and sent you across. And of all the people that ought to know that you're in a kind of a storm and you got the waves and the wind against you in this situation, this is something you can, no matter how much of your back you put into it, you cannot do this on your own. And you've got 12 baskets in the boat with you reminding you objectively of the lesson I just taught you this morning. What should you do? Look up and ask for help. And what do they do instead? They put their heads down and they just try to row harder. So Jesus is going to walk by. Why is he going to walk by? I think two reasons. One, he's going to walk by so that they can be reminded when they see him, uh, look what I can do. Also, a note to point out here, Jesus has already done the miracle of the calming of the sea before this event. So they've already seen his total authority and power over the natural elements of his creation. When he's asleep in the boat, and they're all afraid they're going to drown, which means it was a serious storm. Because if Peter, James, John, and Andrew think they're going to drown, and they're professional fishermen, well acquainted with these waters, this is a major storm. And when they wake up Jesus and say, don't you care about us? We're about to perish. And he stands up and says to the wind, uh, be uh, hush, and to the waves, be still. Not only did the wind stop blowing, instantly the sea went dead calm. Any of you guys have kids? You give your kid a bath? Play with, you know, submarines and cool stuff in the, in, in the tub there with them, right? And then when you pick, you pick little junior or juniorette up, and what do you have? You have the little waves. Have you ever tried to say, hush, be still? I have. It doesn't work. 
Okay, even in a small body of water, what do you still have? The residual effect of gravity. When Jesus stands up and says, be still to the Sea of Galilee, what happens? Instantly, it goes dead calm. Who does Jesus have to be? He's got to be God. What does he have to have? Power over his creation. When he's walking by on the water and intending to pass them by, uh, that's, that's not mocking. That's not indifference. Uh, that's not looking down his nose or, or showing off. That, that is him walking by uh, so close enough that they can see him and go, oh, yeah, Jesus has control over everything. What we ought to do is ask for help. He's given us something to do that we can't do in our own strength. We ought to ask him for help. He's intending to pass them by. Why? To give them an opportunity, at least now, having had yet another reminder of who their Lord is, to just ask him for help. But notice verse 49, when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost. They just panicked and cried out. They all saw him and were terrified, but immediately he spoke to, with them and said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid or stop being afraid. Mark doesn't even mention about Peter saying, well, if it really is you, then bring me out of the boat. And then Peter both passes and fails the test of walking on the water himself. And then he got into the boat with them and the wind stopped. They were utterly astonished. You know what utterly astonished literally means in the Greek? It means utterly astonished. They were blown away. They were just blown away for they had not gained any insight from the incident of the loaves. See, that's the key. They did not learn the lesson Jesus was teaching them as an object lesson from multiplying the loaves. That's why they didn't get it when he was walking on the water. He orchestrates the whole event to teach them when I tell you to do something and you put yourself into doing that with all of your strength and you realize you don't have in yourself enough to accomplish it. What should you do? Look up and ask for help. He gets into the boat with them. They're all blown away. And the reason they're all blown away is that they hadn't learned the lesson from the loaves. Their heart was hardened. And when they had crossed over, they came to the land of Gennesaret and they moored to the shore. And when they got out of the boat, immediately the people recognized him and ran about that whole country and began to carry here and there on their pallets those who were sick to the place they heard he was. And wherever he entered villages or cities or countryside, they were laying the sick in the marketplaces, imploring him that they might touch just the fringe of his coat. And as many as touched him were being cured. Jesus just keeps on ministering, keeps on ministering to the people. Because that's, that's what he expects of us, that we would give ourselves away in ministry, that we would spend our lives in service to others as an act of worship to him because he alone is worthy of it. You think they ever learned the lesson? Well, they do by the time you get to the book of Acts. As we prepare to close, let me just invite you to take your Bibles and turn with me to the book of Acts. I think we'll go to chapter 4. I'll just use this one example. Peter and John get arrested for preaching Christ and doing a miracle in the temple in Acts 3 and 4. And by the time you get to Acts 4 and verse uh, 19, Peter and John answers uh the Sanhedrin, the same, basically the same governing body that condemned Christ and had him crucified. They, they threaten uh, the apostles and tell them to stop preaching and teaching in the name of Jesus. And Peter and John answered and said, whether it's right in the sight of God to give heed to you rather than to God, you need to be the judge. You know, if you want to condemn us for this, if you want to punish us for this, if you want to put us to death like you did Jesus, that's your prerogative. 
okay? If it's right in the sight of God to give to heed to you rather than God, well, you can be the judge because for us, we cannot stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. We cannot stop because we've been commanded by God to do that. If you want to evaluate that we're wrong and punish us, that's between you and God. You're welcome to do that. By the way, when you, when you rebel against a governing authority, you've got to be willing in that context also to suffer the temporal consequences of your action. If you're convinced the governing authority over you is telling you to disobey God, then you obey God. But you freely and willingly accept the temporal consequences of obeying God. That's what they did. And when they had threatened them further... They let them go because they had no basis upon which to punish them on account of the people because they were all glorifying God for what had happened because the man that was healed was more than 40 years old. In verse 23, when they had been released, they went to their own, that is their own uh, companions, their own fellows, the, the, the rest of the church, and they reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. And when they heard this, so they go tell the rest of the apostles and they go tell the church, that this is the threat that we just uh, were given for preaching Christ. And what was the end result? They all lifted their voices to God with one accord and said, O oh Lord, it is you who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and all that's in them, who by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said, Why did the Gentiles rage and the peoples devise futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand and their rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you appointed, both Herod and Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the people of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your purpose predestined to occur. God, you're you're sovereign over all of this and over everything that's happened. You are sovereign, O God. Truly, this whole city was against the Lord Jesus. Now, Lord, take note of their threats, the Sanhedrin's threats against us, and grant that your bondservants may do what? Escape their persecution? Be delivered from the persecution so that that none of us suffer? No. Grant that your bondservants may speak your word with all confidence. Be empowered by you to do what you've commanded us to do. While you extend your hand to heal and signs and wonders take place through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken. And they were all filled with the spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. God gave them the empowerment to be faithful and obedient to him to do exactly as he commanded them to do. Did the apostles ever learn the lesson? Yes. Yes, I think they did. Now the question is, do you understand the lesson? Do we understand the lesson? Do we live a life of faith that looks up when God has given us more to do than we can accomplish in our own power? I'm not asking, uh, I'm, I'm not talking about when you have not done any of your reading and you ask God to miraculously provide you all of the answers for your theology exam. I'm not asking if, if you remember to look up when you have done nothing in your Greek studies for God to give you the gift of tongues so you can pass your Greek and Hebrew exams, okay? I'm talking about when you've done everything within your power to do what God has called you to do and give and fulfill the responsibilities that God has given you to fulfill, when you get to the point where you're at the end of yourself and you truly are serving Him and being obedient to Him and to the best of your ability glorifying Him and realize it's beyond what you can accomplish in your own strength, at that point, at that point, have you called on Him not to do a miracle for you but to empower you to be faithful to Him and accomplish what He's given you to do? I remember in church history, I don't know if you still use this one, but I remember when we went through church history, one of the examples that we were given was of Martin Luther. Listen, this is first semester, or maybe I guess it was second semester, and this so rang true in my heart. Martin Luther said, I have so much to do today 
I need to double my time in prayer before I begin my day. Isn't this like the opposite of the way most people behave? I have so much to do today, I'm going to reduce the amount of time I spend in prayer. I can't tell you how many times. I, listen, my plate tends to be a little full. Uh, and I tend to have things added to it at the last minute. And you know what? I grew up under, under magnificent men of God who taught us that we need to be ready to preach, pray, or die within a minute. That we need to be ready to be his servants all day, every day. And you know something? That's more than I can do in my own strength. I can't tell you how many times I ask for God to help me to learn things. I've, listen, I've never been one of the sharper knives in the drawer. Never. But I've worked harder than most. And I've been more desperate than most and asked for help more than most. And God has always answered my prayers, not with magical, all of a sudden, bang, the lights go on. But as I ask for help, I have found him always to be faithful, to provide me a little extra endurance, a little extra open eye time, a, a little extra memory to be able to actually process and assimilate the material that the faithful men of God were investing in me. You as a seminary student need to learn this lesson, to learn to look up. When, when you're given more to do than you can do in your own strength, when, when you're given more reading than anybody can really do and actually process all of it in a single semester, you want to know why those kinds of assignments are given to you? Because one of the things we're really trying to do is help you to be a better reader and a faster reader because your whole life is going to be about reading. Your whole life is going to be about thinking. Your whole life is going to be about exegesis. Your whole, you're going to have to, as you do exegesis of passage after passage, you're going to have to be able to draw upon your comprehensive familiarity with systematic theology and biblical theology. Everything isn't stated in every single passage. There are going to be times when you're going to be called upon to preach, called upon to speak on God's behalf, ministering to others, and you're going to need to, to learn to call upon God to give you the patience, to give you the energy, to give you the conviction to stand for him and be willing to serve him. You cannot do ministry in your own strength and be doing it for the glory of God all the time. You can't. This is way too big a task for any of us. You need to learn to look up. There are things in pastoral ministry where you have to confront Somebody that's an elder who perhaps is not qualified to be an elder, and it's a very strong personality. You perhaps have not noticed that I'm not exactly an individual of significant stature. I'm vertically challenged. But you know what? I'm not speaking for me. And I don't care if the person I'm talking to is seven feet tall. I'm acting on God's behalf, and you can squash me like a bug. But, but I know who I'm, I'm speaking on behalf of. I know who I have to act on behalf of. And I know who is with me. And, and that's got to be it. And I learned those lessons, not just from this text, but this text applied in, in those kinds of seminary classroom situations when, when I had questions and couldn't find the answers and I asked for answers. I had questions, and I, I didn't know the answer, and I didn't even understand the questions sometimes. And I would ask God. You need to learn to look up in life and ministry. There are times in your marriage. There are times with your kids. There are times in the church. There are times in life. There are times in ministry when, when part of the test that God is giving us is, okay, I gave you a challenge that's beyond what you can do in yourself. Now, be faithful to me, trust in me, obey me, and when you realize that you don't have it in yourself to do all this by yourself, ask me to help you obey me. And you know what you can count on? If you really are just trying to obey God, he will always give you what you need. And 12 baskets full afterwards as a lesson for tomorrow. Father, thank you so much.
for sending your son to die for us. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for being willing to take upon yourself all the limitations of humanity and live among us. I cannot imagine what an incredible step down that must be. I have no idea why you would, why you would love me or any of us. But you do because you've said so and you've proven it. You demonstrated your love toward us and while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And when you rose again once and for all, proving who you were and that you've made a way for us, you applied your grace to us through your spirit and gave us new hearts and new lives. I just would ask you to help us, O oh Lord, to live our lives as an expression of appreciation and thanksgiving to you for what you've done for us in Christ. And help us indeed to continue to depend upon you to live the life you've called us to live because we are desperately in need of you to empower us to live beyond ourselves. In Christ's name and for his glory, I pray. And all God's people said, amen.